This is going to continue the study of finding Jesus in the book of Genesis. And we left off in chapter 11. We're going to look at verse or chapter 12. But before we go there, let's read those verses again that show Jesus Christ himself explaining how you can find him in the Old Testament. In Luke 24, 27, it says, And beginning at Moses and the prophets, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus showed the disciples verses about himself in the Old Testament. You see, all Jesus had at this point was the Old Testament. He didn't have the New Testament. So he went to Moses and all the prophets. When it says, and beginning at Moses, that's referring to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. When it says all the prophets, that's, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And he showed scriptures concerning himself in those books of the Bible. And then in John 5, 39, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. If Jesus Christ told people to search the scriptures when he was here on this earth, the only scripture they had was the Old Testament. And he said, These are they which testify of me. So out of the Lord Jesus Christ's own mouth, he's telling you you can find him in the Old Testament. Then in John 5, 46 and 47, he says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And he wrote of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So with that introduction again, we'll go to chapter 12 in Genesis, and we'll see how... <clears throat> Abraham, this man Abraham, shows you the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So in Genesis 12 and verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So right off the bat, you see something. Abraham is told to leave home just like the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, before the Lord Jesus Christ came down to earth as a man, he lived in heaven, the third heaven. Second Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So, Jesus Christ left heaven. He left the riches of heaven to come down to be a poor person on this earth and go through things that poor people on this earth go through. He left his home because the Father wanted him to, just like Abraham left home because God wanted him to. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of the godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And that's when Jesus Christ left his home. That was God manifesting himself in the flesh on this earth. So you see the similarity there. Then in verse 2, it says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. That's what God says to Abraham. And that's also what happened to Jesus Christ when he left home. Jesus' name is also made great. If you look at Philippians 2, 8 through 10, it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and being and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. So Jesus it has the name above every name. And the Lord Jesus Christ it should have the preeminence in everything. Now verse 2. Abraham becomes the father of the Jews. It says, And I will make of thee a great nation. Just like Abraham becomes the father of the Jews, the Jews is the line from which Christ came. He came from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He came from that line. In the sense of Jesus Christ as a man, 
he came from the line of Abraham. So this is where the seed start, really gets going here, through Abraham. And you've seen the devil try to corrupt the seed all through the book of Genesis. He tried to corrupt it uh, in Genesis 6 with the giants. Before that, he tried to corrupt it with uh, Cain and Abel. He moved Cain to kill Abel to try to corrupt the seed. And now, you see how the Lord is really, in Genesis chapter 12, he's really putting this thing into effect. And he's going to give Abraham, make the seed come through Abraham. And then it says in Genesis 12, 11, if you look at Genesis 12, 11, it says, And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with thee for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So Abraham, <clears throat> out of fear, is telling his wife Sarah to tell the Egyptians that he's not really, that he's not, that she's not his wife, but that she is his sister. And this is a half-truth. Because Sarah is Abraham's half-sister. So this shows us one thing here, that a, a half-truth is still a lie. This shows us something else, that Sarah is going to lie about her husband, just like Christians many times lie about who, they're, who they belong to. You see, as Christians, we are the bride of Christ, and our husband is the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times Christians will lie and say that they're not a Christian. To get along with the world. And Egypt is a top of the world. So Sarah is going to lie to the Egyptians. A top of the world. To get along. So that Abraham doesn't die. And Abraham being a top of Jesus here. <clears throat> so you see the connection there. Many Christians will sell out to the world. And, and not tell people. About being a Christian. They won't speak up about the Bible. And the things of the Bible. Because they're scared of the world, the Egyptians. But it says in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So Sarah lies about her husband, like the bride of Christ today lies about theirs. And that's a lot of reason we're in such, such bad shape. And that's why there's such a falling away going on. Then if you turn over to... Genesis 14, 14. We'll see something there. In Genesis 14, 14, it says, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Something interesting here is, <clears throat> I myself personally, for a long time, thought of Abraham as one of the more soft characters in the Bible, you know, compared to David and Joshua and uh, Elijah and people like that. But when you really look at it, Abraham is not a soft character. He was, you know, sharp enough, strong enough to train his own servants. And he was a warrior. And this reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ because <clears throat> just like I always pictured Abraham as this soft type of character, how is Jesus portrayed today? He's portrayed as this soft character that gets along with everything and everybody and never says anything bad to anybody. Uh, that's how they portray him on TV. That's how they portray him in the contemporary Christian scene, music scene. But the Lord is a man of war just like Abraham. The Bible says the Lord is a man of war in Exodus 15, verse 3. And Jesus has servants, according to John eighteen thirty six, And his servants are going to fight one day at the second coming. And the blood's going to be up to the horse's bridles. Jesus Christ is a rough character just like Abraham is a rough character. <clears throat> it says in John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So Jesus Christ is a warrior with trained servants who are coming back with him at the second coming. And he's going to take the kingdom by force. He says himself in Matthew 10, 34, Think, that, think not that I am come 
<clears throat> to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. So Jesus Christ isn't just about everyone getting together. He's about everyone getting together for the truth, not getting together and putting up with everybody's false doctrine and everything like that. But then if you get over to Genesis 14, 18, you're going to see another really interesting character that shows up here named Melchizedek. Melchizedek. He's also a great picture of Jesus Christ to the point that many people believe that he was Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And some things that are similar about them, we'll go ahead and read about him here in verse 18. It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. So the thing about Melchizedek is he's a prophet, priest, and king. Just like Jesus is a prophet, priest, and king. And it's says a lot about him in Hebrews. In Hebrews 7, 3 and 4, it says, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. That reminds you of Jesus there. Because Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Jesus had no beginning and he has no ending. But made like unto the Son of God. It says Melchizedek is made like unto the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? The Lord Jesus Christ. Abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, and to whom even the patriarch David gave the tenth of the spoils. So just like it calls Melchizedek greater than Abraham here, in John eight fifty eight, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Showing superiority over Abraham. Showing that he was before Abraham. Now, that's Melchizedek. And he's, there's just so many ways you could go with him. Some people say he was Shem. Some people say he's a, a, an appearance of the Holy Spirit. Some people say he was Jesus Christ, a pre-appearance of Jesus. You know, there's all types of things you could look at on him, but we won't get bogged down on him. In chapter 15, verses 5 through 6, this is back on Abraham. It says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And it says, And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. This is the imputed righteousness of, the, of, of Jesus Christ as a picture. See, a Abraham didn't get the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ here, but he got imputed righteousness. Righteousness that wasn't his own. The Lord gave him righteousness here. Abraham wasn't looking forward to the cross here. He was believing God about his seed that it talked about there in verse 5. And Abraham, he just believed it. He took it by faith. You see, even though Abraham was an, was an old man, his wife was old. And he believed God that the Lord was going to give him a son in his old age to bring that seed. And this pictures the imputed righteousness that we get at salvation. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says in Romans 4, 3, For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So just like Abraham got righteousness by believing God about his seed, we get imputed righteousness by believing the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're putting our trust in that to save us. Now, 15 and verse 16, chapter 15 and verse 16 in Genesis, it says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, it says, For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What's not full? Their cup's not yet full. You see, there is a cup, and when a nation or people sin, the cup gets more full. The cup of the entire sin of the world was put on Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. All the sin of all mankind, the cup of God's wrath, was poured out onto the Lord Jesus Christ. And he died for every single sin. He, any sin that you have in the past, he died for it. Any sin that you're going to do in the future, he died for it. And that's where the, I mean, even if you're saved right now and you sin tomorrow, Jesus died for that sin. That's why you're eternally saved. Once you believe the gospel, all your sins are paid for. 
You should want to live right because you love Jesus Christ, not to earn your way to heaven, because Jesus already earned your way to heaven. But that's the cup of God, God's wrath. Jesus said, let, let this cup pass from me. That's the cup of God's wrath that would be poured out on him on the cross. Then in Genesis 16, 1 through 7, you're going to see the devil try to corrupt the seed again. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So you see that the problem here was Abram and Sarah couldn't wait on the Lord to bring Isaac, the promised seed, to him. They couldn't, they, they had a problem with being patient here. So Sarah, in, in such a rush to get that child, she gives Hagar, her handmaid, to Abram. And he lays with Hagar. And this, this causes Ishmael to be born. This causes a group of people to be born that would be an enemy of God's people. And see, this is nothing more than the devil getting in there moving Abraham and Sarah to make this decision because he doesn't want the promised seed to be born. He doesn't want Isaac to be born because of that promise made back there in Genesis 3.15 when the Lord told the serpent, He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So ever since then, the devil has sought to corrupt the seed. And that's what Genesis about is. That's how you find Jesus in Genesis. Is In Genesis, He is the promised seed. So that's how you see Jesus there. The devil's trying to get into that seed and corrupt it. And then if you want to turn to Genesis 16, 1 through 7, or Genesis 17, 10 through 12. In Genesis 17, 10 through 12, it says, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So, right here, God is giving Abraham the sign of circumcision. This is physical circumcision. But you know how this shows us Jesus Christ? Because at salvation, we get something called the spiritual circumcision. In Colossians 2.11, it says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Notice that phrase, made without hands. That shows you it's spiritual and not physical. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You see, before you were saved, you were not uh, you were uncircumcised spiritually. Then, when you believe the gospel, you are now spiritually circumcised. And what happened was God cut your soul loose from your flesh. Now, when you sin, those sins aren't applied to the soul like they were before you were saved, because your flesh. It's cut loose from the soul. See, before you were saved, your soul and your flesh were stuck together. When you sinned, those sins weren't just on the flesh. They were also put to the soul. And that's why you get to go to heaven. Because your soul is righteous. You're, you're righteous now that you're saved. And your body will finally be righteous one day at the rapture. But then look at verse 12. It says, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. And eight is the number of new beginnings. And you know what happens at salvation? You become a new creature. He's circumcised. At eight. He's telling them to circumcise them at eight days old. Eight's the number for new beginnings. At salvation, when you're spiritually circumcised, you become a new creature. It's a new beginning for you. Now, some more things about 
Jesus Christ in Genesis is in Genesis 17, 19. It says, And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. You see, Isaac is a You see, Isaac is a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, both Jesus Christ and Isaac's names are foretold before their birth. The same way the Lord tells them what uh, Isaac's name is going to be, the same way he tells an angel, the angel of the Lord tells Joseph what the son's name is going to be. In Matthew 1, 20 through 21, it says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph... Thou son of David, for not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So there, both Isaac and the Lord Jesus Christ's names are foretold.